Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beard of Device Pilot, and today I'm very pleased to welcome Claire Miller, who's Director of Technology and Innovation at Octopus Electric Vehicles. Welcome, Claire. Hi, Pilgrim. Thanks for having me. So looking forward to hearing your experiences in smart energy. I already know a little bit about what you did beforehand because you were incredibly helpful at my previous company, Alert Me, in helping us uh, scale up. So very appreciative of your efforts there. But now you're <laughs> now you're with Octopus. Um, and, uh, you know, we know Octopus not just as an energy utility that's quite uh, innovative with agile tariffs and so on, but we hear mm -hmm. uh, your CEO, Greg, talking about heat pumps. You're doing electric vehicles. You know, can you just kind of paint a picture of where the electric vehicles part of Octopus fits in, inside the overall sort of umbrella of the organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have a lot going on. Thank you for painting that picture. Um, there is a lot of innovation all across the business. And, uh, you know, as a group, innovation and tech is really at the heart of what we're doing. And trying to bring those things together is really important um, as we move towards this, you know, energy system of the future. So in electric vehicles, we uh, um, our main mission is to help people on that journey to um, transition away from um, you know classic petrol diesel vehicles into uh, you know non-polluting uh, no tailpipe emission vehicles and hopefully to tie that up with totally renewable energy to to power that vehicle whether that's in your home with a tariff which works uh, with our renewable energy um, and also on the go as well so we have a number of other kind of products which help customers whether they're charging on the go in different places. Um, so we focus on leasing vehicles and we think that's also really important for customers to be able to access a vehicle uh, in a way that's flexible. And so at the moment we have been focusing on salary sacrifice, which uh, helps us to get to uh, many more uh, people than I think would, would normally be able to access a vehicle by helping them through their company and actually paying for that vehicle as part of their pay packet. And, uh, and later on this year, we'll be looking to launch something for a broader market for um, individuals to access as well. So having that flexibility to uh, have an electric vehicle and try it and learn to live with it, I think is also very important because it's quite a new technology to offer people and uh, and the technology is moving on all the time. So yeah, so we focus on leasing. And then uh, with another, uh, I guess, viewpoint, we're also involved in innovation using electric vehicles. So something that we've um, been working on particularly focused and particularly hard over the last few years actually is vehicle to grid. So how do you help someone who's got an electric vehicle put energy back onto the grid via their home? So vehicle to home, vehicle to grid and, uh, and support the grid that we've got uh, to do more. So, um, so yes, there's quite a broad range of things we're doing in the electric vehicle space. Yes. So just to kind of dig into that a little more, are you mainly focused on consumer facing propositions or do you also have propositions for businesses, maybe fleet vehicles or workplace charging and that kind of thing? I mean, it, it sounds like a facetious answer, but yes, Pilgrim, yes, we are all of those things. So, you know, many, many kind of teams and, and, and folk across the business looking at those propositions and actually, we're at a point now, I think, um, not necessarily a scale, you know, it's not hundreds of hundreds of people. We, we, we're quite lean in terms of our numbers of, of team members, but in terms of bringing together the technologies, bringing together the solutions to bear on these challenges. And actually, you mentioned fleet. Fleet, and in terms of the impact that decarbonisation of fleet will have, is, is proportionately higher, actually, across decarbonising transport. And I think, you know, it's not something you think about day to day, but the number of vans, um, light goods vehicles and heavy goods vehicles, buses, there are all kinds of vehicles out there which are helping the world to work, you know, helping helping everybody's day to day. You just don't really think about it. When you do start to do the numbers, there's a huge challenge there that we're really scratching the surface of. So we're starting to work with fleet in terms of actually swapping out, you know, numbers of vans like good vehicles etc but also looking at the solutions which enable that so you mentioned workplace charging and actually thinking about a joined up world where you might have a a, a person who drives a, a van for a living they might need to charge that at home overnight so they're ready in the morning they might need to charge that at the workplace when they're picking up they might need to charge elsewhere so we are thinking about that absolutely and um and i think you know the the infrastructure that goes along with that as well is very important. And I know something that, that you were thinking about and how you know we get the right level of control and data is also quite challenging. So uh, whichever the application, whether it's for you know a, an individual customer at home wishing to, uh, to use their EV to get a good tariff at home and to help the grid, or whether that's a business looking at how do I, how do I transition my fleet? 
actually having all of those solutions that work together is very important to us. And that's something that we think about day to day as we start to build out different bits of our systems. That makes sense. I mean, so speaking of joining it up, in terms of the the different parts of Octopus, as it were, are you mm. fairly standalone in terms of doing the EV part of Octopus? Or, or is it quite an important part of your proposition that you can also offer people a tariff which will be sort of sympathetic to their charging needs and possibly some other services and products that sort of go around that? Or, or at the moment, is it all fairly isolated and then in time it might join up? No, much more towards the latter. So actually, um, uh, Fiona Howarth, who uh, you also know from Alert Me Days, uh, who's CEO of, of Oxford Electric Vehicles, um, uh, you know, she actually was was leading on that, you know, electric vehicle driver tariff thinking, uh, which in a, which ultimately became Octopus Go, which I think a lot of people will have heard of, um, which is a time of use tariff, which offers cheaper charging at nighttime uh, and and more expensive in the daytime focused on the idea that you can charge your vehicle whilst you sleep and actually from there we've now grown uh into the flexibility space so that concept of uh it's valuable to have access to a battery to store energy at times when it's being generated but there is not that much load on the grid so again the classic use case overnight on a windy night there's an awful lot of wind energy being generated which is wonderful and we need more of it but we need to have somewhere to put it so that when we all wake up in the morning and want to go about our day to day, we can then use that energy. And so that concept of charging overnight in a simplistic model has actually now evolved to being smart charging concept. Uh, so it's called intelligent octopus where we actually send a signal because we're integrated with the vehicle or with the charger that you're using at home, we can send a signal to say, please charge at these times because it's valuable to the grid. And then we can use that in the flexibility market. And that's how business models of the future will work. And that's how that is working is, you know, you have this, you know, this complementary balance. And again, to bring that into the context of um, your point about, you know, bundles and, and I, I guess bringing the whole solution. Yes, for individuals, we want to Bring that to people so if you take a car through one of our salary sacrifice schemes for example um you get the car on a lease you get the you get the access to a, a charger and a charger installer as part of octopus so you can choose and, and buy your charger and, and and pay for the install through us um as a holistic experience so you have charger and car arriving at the same time and tariff so we help you to switch across your tariff and give you some free miles so that is either in the form of um credit on your account on your energy account if you're charging at home or in terms of um credit on electric juice network which is our uh, go charge uh service where we've worked with multiple charging partners osprey chargey and others um where you can charge your vehicle and the charge for that actually the cost of the charge for that as opposed to the electricity charge the cost of the charge goes onto your energy bill so you pay on your energy bill uh, monthly so we have a range of options there and uh and yeah it will only continue to grow so it seems i mean just picking up on some of those themes it seems like we're going as is often the case with technology we're going through a phase where things could actually get sort of a bit more complicated and a little bit less convenient for a bit we've got these these tariffs that are obviously more complex than a, a flat tariff <laughs> Um, yes. and, and obviously people having to learn how to behave differently with electric vehicles to take advantage of that potentially. Um, one of the interesting kind of realizations about owning an electric vehicle is total cost of ownership. I mean, how yes. actually, although electric vehicles are very high capital costs still today, their running costs are so incredibly low that as a total cost of ownership, if you're going to own them for any length of time, or if you buy them as a lease, then uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the running costs can be really low, which is fan fantastic. Um, is that how you... You know, is that how you think ultimately that you want to be able to offer people a low total cost of ownership rather than having to bother them with the details of exactly how the tariff works or exactly how the intelligent charge management works and so on? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I think at the moment we're still at an early stage where um, folk want to kind of run the numbers and to understand like but but how much is a charge what does it mean how many mm. miles is that okay and how many how many pence is that what is it what's the equivalent if I look at that compared to filling up at a pump and actually uh, something that's very very sort of front of mind at the moment is you know we're heading towards two pounds a litre probably above two pounds a litre for petrol and diesel fuels um, and actually even though we also have this competing challenge at the moment of an energy crisis, as it's been being spoken about, you know, the price of wholesale energy has gone up. Actually, 
the cost of running your electric vehicle is still um, still much cheaper and, it, and will still continue to be much cheaper as the world kind of writes itself. So we do envisage a time where, um, again, something else that we're working on and looking at is how do you bring together the cost of the lease of the vehicle and access to smart charging services? So you're, um, you know, you're complementing one with the other. And so, um, yeah, something that's, that's sort of close to my heart, actually, and, and thinking about, you know, expanding smart charging, which is, you know, charging overnight at a time that makes sense for the grid and, and time flexibility and and also being able to export so being able to take a bit of energy out of the battery and put it back into your home or back onto the grid that is leading towards a kind of yeah a total cost of ownership model where you bring together the cost of leasing the vehicle and fueling the vehicle uh with your with your home tariff and actually you know as one of the side benefits for example of that um it means that you have this cheap period of energy where you can use that for whatever you want to, not just charging your vehicle. And I think that's also something that uh, it's, it's hard to explain it when you're just talking about a car. When you start to get into the conversation with people, you, you can actually really expand their minds to say, well, you know, if you can time your um, your dishwasher, your washing machine, your, you know, insert electric using device here, if you can time that, uh, then you're going to get the benefit of that cheap rate. And we do see that nudging uh, really starts to impact people's whole lives. So I think, yes, it's just a car, but actually it, it brings a lot of other benefits and to the way people are living their lives and changing the way that they use energy. Yeah, I've certainly noticed that people sometimes talk about it as a sort of gateway drug, get you know, a solar panel yeah. or electric <laughs> vehicle or something that just makes you suddenly aware in real time of, of your energy production and, and consumption totally and whether you have excess and if you're spilling it to the grid and you're not being paid for that, what else could I do with that power? You know, all those kinds yeah. of questions. It's so different from the old world of a, of a utility bill once a year. You know, sort of. yeah, and and yeah, I mean, agree. in terms of cost, um, cost as well, I noticed someone uh, yesterday tweeted that the... Uh, for the first time, their car has cost more than £100 to fill up with uh, with petrol gasoline. And wow. um, I mean, you know, I mean, it cost me a tenth of that to charge my car. So uh, it really is a massive differential. Um, some mm. a technology you mentioned a couple of times so far, and which Herbert Deese uh, mentioned uh, the other day, actually, the chairman of uh, VW, is vehicle mm. to grid. So I think he announced yes. that all the VW cars are going to have vehicle vehicle to grid enabled by software updates this year, yes. which is really sort of eye-opening news. Um, I mean, to some extent, that's been something people have been talking about for a long time. There have been concerns on about sort of wear on the battery and uh, not certainly not all cars support it. In fact, I think most cars don't support it. Um, do you have to have a different charger? Where does the inverter go to get the power, you know, going the other way? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. can you just tell us a little bit more about vehicle to grid? I mean, is it is it real? <laughs> um, you know, how's it going to work? <laughs> when's it going to when is when's it going to become significant? Um, uh, and and who will who will manage it as well? Yeah, oh, these are all e excellent questions, and not that I would expect anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, these are all very insightful questions. So, so vehicle to grid definitely real. So. Um, Again, you know me. I've uh, I've had it in my house since uh, summer 2020. So I've done a lot of the uh, early testing and, and like hands-on development myself. Um, but it's a pleasure, but also uh, it, it is quite new. And trying to uh, trying to build a, a service and a kind of a proposition on top of technology, which itself is also new, uh, is like the extreme end of innovation. So I will say it has been a long project for us for lots of reasons, and and a part of that is you mentioned um, like the car and the charger. Well, the car at the moment that can do it is a Nissan Leaf. It has something called Chadmo, which is a, a protocol which allows charging and discharging physically, but also uh, has the data and communications involved in that. Actually, Chadmo is unfortunately a bit of the Betamax of the charging world. And we're moving to a world of uh, type two connector. So the type two connector, uh, sorry, CCS um, type two connector in, in Europe and uh, a type one CCS version in America, which has that, that connector at the top and then two DC pins underneath the AC, AC connector is the top part and then it has two DC pins at the bottom. And so there's a shift in what the charger looks like. There's a shift in the way that the communications will work, but the services that we've built and the experiences we've had will remain the same. So it's about, you know, we're kind of moving to a different enabling technology, but what we've learned about vehicle to grid in the, in the domestic setting um, will remain and, we will expand on. So just to take that a bit further. So at the moment, um, 
the conversion between alternating current that comes from the grid and direct current, which the battery needs, uh, happens in the charger. So the chargers are very special, specialized. Um, there's a handful that can do it. And there are none that are commercially available. So at the moment you could go and you could buy a, a variety of chargers and have them installed within a few weeks uh, from a range of manufacturers for your standard electric vehicle. Whereas for uh, a Chadamo bi-directional charger, which is to give it its full name, um, that inverter is actually in the charger itself. And you need this one vehicle, this Nissan Leaf vehicle uh, to be able to do it. And, that, and they're not available um, you know, for sale generally. Now that might change actually. Um, the, the folks that have been developing it have been developing it for a long time and investing a lot in it. Uh, so I'm excited to see that come to market because there are a lot of Nissan Leaf out there actually. And there are a lot of... Uh, the Nissan Leaf is a real workhorse vehicle, and uh, uh, it's it's exciting to me as an engineer that there are cars out there that have the potential to do this, that could have that potential unlocked. But for most people, you mentioned you know VW unlocking um, this capability over the air, you know with an over the air software update. What that says to me is that those cars are physically ready to be able to do uh, vehicle to grid, and it's a software challenge we need to overcome. So there will be uh challenges there and uh, to get quite technical so apologies to anyone who's you know fast forward over this bit around the technicalities of it but there is a software protocol called iso 15118 and that is the international standard which outlines multiple layers in fact seven separate layers of of communications and control um, between the car charger and other parts of the infrastructure i think the end of your question was you know who's who's going to be controlling it who's going to be doing it well actually we're right at the start of this journey. So uh, you, you've, you might have heard of, your listeners might have heard of um, plug and charge. So plug and charge uh, is a concept where your car uh, plugs into a public charge point and the car and the charge point have a handshake, a digital handshake. And it's possible because the car has a, a unique certificate, a, a digital certificate. The uh, the charge point similarly has a certificate and can read what your car has. And you have signed up to a service where you've registered your vehicle. And so there's a handshake that happens literally on that plugging in action, which says, we know this car, we know this user, we know they have an account, we know how to register your charge and we know how to bill you. <laughs> Crucially, there always needs to be that financial transaction. And so plug and charge means that you don't have to use a, a card to touch or an app. It all happens for you because it's already there digitally between the car and the charger. That uses ISO 15118. So it's really here and it's out there right now in some systems and VW, um, also Porsche and others are, are starting to adopt that. So we're on the journey. But to put it into the context of vehicle to grid, there are many more steps that need to happen. We need the cars, we need the chargers, we need the services, and which is what as Octopus we have we have built and we are we are you know looking forward to rolling out as these physical pieces of infrastructure come. Um, but there's also other people in the other actors, I should say, in the ecosystem. So there could be uh, as an energy supplier, as a maybe as a aggregator, as a as a provider of flexibility services, as a DNO, and the DNO is the distributed network operators who who manage and look after the network from the step down from the national grid all the way to your house and all the way to businesses. They're on their own transitional journey to become service providers, so DSOs. Um, they will be able to see which batteries on wheels, i.e. vehicles, are available, how much battery at what time, and send a signal using this protocol to say, hey, provider of, of a service, can you tell your car to turn on, please? Because we really could use it right now in this street or this district or this town. So the vision for the future, you know, it's not just my vision, although I'm very passionate about it, is a digitally enabled energy ecosystem where we can see these devices, we can see these cars, and we can see how much battery is there. And we can match that to, to demand and to restrictions and to start to really you know, play that system to make the most of all these batteries that we're rolling out right now today. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, yeah, so I think you paint a picture of some interesting things where the, most of the technologies are sort of getting there, but maybe, maybe scale for vehicle to grid is still a little way away. 
for sure. You, you mentioned the DNOs and the transition from DNO to DSO. So when mm. I hear DNO, I think of the slightly old fashioned organization that I might have to, you know, if I want to do something to my grid connection, I want to move to mm-hmm. three phase or something like that. I fill out a form and a few months later, somebody might come and do something. <laughs> They're all a bit old fashioned, but they're yeah. basically responsible for the for the wires that go from my house to the local substation. Um, it's a quite a physical sort of thing. But um, uh, when you know when you talk about DSO services, I mean, can, can you just sort of explain not just in vehicle to grid, but in a broader sense? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can understand why, just like we have to manage the the central part of the grid tra- with the transmission part and, and generation and you know, demand and, and um, uh, uh, production needs needs to balance all the time. So I can see there's a similar kind of equation happening at the edge in terms of not overloading the wires um, and, and that kind of stuff. But but is there something more to it? I mean, what what in your mind, what's the difference between a DSO and a DNO? What's this transition that they're on? Absolutely, um, you, and you're right. Um, at, you know, they they are all, all of them at different stages of their own uh, yeah their transition, their own journey um, to becoming much less, uh, I would say, tactical about these energy devices and more strategic. And that means that, um, and I should explain for people who don't know what a DNO is, they, there are uh, a number of them around the country split up into geographic regions. Um, and as you say, they are responsible for that physical infrastructure, but as part of their charter, they're natural monopolies. And as part of their kind of their charter for managing that part of the local grid, um, they need to be thinking strategically about um, how much capacity is needed. And that's a really big question. And I think, you know, we've heard a lot, certainly over the last sort of six months to a year of, you know, can the grid cope? Will the grid melt? You know, will there be enough to go round? And that's part of the challenge on this DNO to DSO journey is actually having much better visibility of what is on the grid and at a local level and being able to make the most of that. So, there are lots of challenges there around um, monitoring which have not been there before so right now there's not a huge amount of monitoring i mean it's, I'm, I'm painting a broad, broad brush here but you know there's not a lot of monitoring going on at the very local level mm-hmm. so if you happen to know where your local substation is you might see it as you drive to, to work or you know you're, you're walking around your local area um there will be some monitoring but there's not much below that and so um getting a good view of what's going on and where there's a lot of demand very locally, where there might be restrictions or overloads, that's going to be part of it. Understanding how do they digitize their view of their bit of the world um, in order to make the most of what they've got. Also, um, getting ahead of these restrictions, what, what I mean by that is where you do have people who are on a street uh, or in, a, in an area who are starting to see electric cars arrive on neighbors' driveways or they're starting to see, you know, um, solar panels appearing on on the school or you know big batteries starting to be built for grid connections um it starts to raise the awareness as we said before you know the gateway drugs that the, the evs and the pv where people think oh I, I could get that i could do that there's actually growing interest and going to be growing demand and so another part of what's important from that dno to dso transition is actually making it much easier for individuals and customers to interact with them so the form you mentioned is a really interesting one on power loop we we knew that a big part of what we wanted to um, look at was around this customer journey with the DNO. We actually partnered with UKPN. So UKPN are the DNO that covers the east of England through London and down to the south coast. Um, and, and they wanted to learn more too. And so we have been through that, um, that transition with them of actually, this is a very long-winded process to get permission to export energy from your car to the grid. There was a form, it took a long time, it's a very slow process. And what they've done over the course of the project, they've invested in a digital portal. So now you can go online. Um, they've, vehicle to grid is a, a separate category from an electric vehicle charger or a standard one or a solar panel or battery and made it much smoother for customers and understanding that you know this is a consumer product and people want to get it soon and they want to know soon if they can have it. There's a whole load of um, important you know, management topics around putting energy back on the grid so that's another part and the final part on this dno to dso transition i would say uh, is thinking about um back to what i said about the you know the digital connection and understanding what's on the grid is that financial connection and saying like we will reward you if you can give us somewhere to put this energy 
or we will reward you if you can give us a bit of energy back at these times. So that's the thing to keep in mind. It's that energy has a different value depending on um, the time of day and the amount of demand and the amount of supply on the grid. And I think that's where the DNO to DSO transition is uh, so important, is being able to actually give those digital signals to us as an energy supplier, as a, as a manager of multiple electric vehicles, for example. Um, and it's not just us, there are others who, who are building you know, services around this to say, a signal has come from the local grid to say that this road or these three streets or this area is very restricted right now because everybody's put their electric oven and their kettles on and it's, it's tea time. Can you turn on these 10 vehicles? Can you turn on these 100 vehicles? Can you... And, and give back a little bit of energy to the grid. So when I think about that distributed, you know, digital energy system, the DNO to the DSO transition is so important because sending out that signal to say, now's a good time and we'll pay you for it, uh, is, is really the glue that ties this whole thing together is at a local level. That's a very clear picture. And I'm having, I've got all sorts of metaphors in my head of the internet of energy and uh, organic yeah. and so on. Really interesting. I mean, does that mean in terms of the, the business relationships and the flow of money and all the rest of it. At mm. the moment, it feels like we've got the end users and we've got the utilities and they, they kind of have the relation, the business yeah. relationship as it were, but actually between them are these transmission operators and distribution operators and so on who haven't really been kind of directly, you know, ostensibly in that loop, at least as far as that yes. relationship's concerned. Do you think that's how it will continue to be? So, I mean, it sounds like the DSOs will be wanting to manage their local networks better and will be providing signals and, and receiving signals to kind of do that. But mm. how will the economic, how, how will that, how will the signals flow? I mean, would they be talking to utilities to do that or would they be talking through transmission operators to aggregate it all? Or how, how do those connections actually work sort of behind the scenes to make, mm. to make, to make me know that I can charge my car right now if I'm on an Oxford tariff or whatever? How, how does the, how does the DSO sort of, um, signaling, sort of connecting with yeah. you, you as a utility, for example. Who, how does that work? Yeah, I, mean, that, I think that's actually the next killer question. Is <laughs> how is this going to happen uh, reliably and at scale? Um, so we are working actually with, a, with, with one of the DNOs at the moment on trialing exactly this, which is who needs to receive that signal and, and who then acts upon it? Um, I think... Uh, you know, energy retailers are a natural home for that because uh, behind the scenes, we're already receiving pricing signals um, and mm. have a view of, you know, like settlement, like amounts and periods for uh, for that interconnection between the DNO, like the local grid level. So I think that is a natural place for it to happen. But there are you know other third parties that are seeing business opportunities here um, to be service providers to the customer. So you know by that I mean here's an app. We need to make sure that we can talk to your vehicle, say, and we can control that remotely. And then when we know we can control your vehicle remotely, you know. It, it's, it's the same kind of customer experience. You tell us when you want that vehicle back in the morning, you tell us how much um, charge you want in your vehicle. We will take that pain away. We will make that happen for you and we will somehow reward you. We will somehow, and, and there are lots of models. It's, it's very early days. So it's quite fascinating actually to see the ones that are bubbling up and that innovation in business model itself is quite fun hmm. to watch. Um, they are then looking at, okay, well, how do they monetize access to those batteries? And that, so part of that may be, providing visibility to the DNOs on their DNO to DSO, they will start ingesting signals from the local grid and, and inserting that themselves ultimately into that you know, value chain. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how it does net out. Um, and something that I'm really excited about and heartened by is how much uh, the DNOs are starting to embrace like digitization and open data. And uh, they're all at different stages. For sure. And in fact, as part of PowerLoop, we've been um, working with all the DNOs, in interviewing them and getting their views on where they think they're at in that transition from DNO to DSO and what their plans are. And we've framed that around like vehicle to grid. You know, that that's our lens with PowerLoop. And so looking forward to actually publishing that um, hopefully in the next couple of months, actually, that report will come out looking at what is the landscape and, and how how mature are these models or, or not and what needs to happen next. So, yeah watch the space and um, we you know, we've got something coming there um 
but I think uh, it is a, is a really important area to, to see and, and to see their digitization journeys is really exciting. Mm. They also have a lot of data, open data that they're making available. So anyone that's interested in data modeling, visualization um, and building new business models, have a look, particularly UKPN and WPD. They have really rich open data sources now that you can start to ingest into your own apps and visualizations. So if that's your thing, then go and have a look. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, this has been a much broader and deeper sort of discussion of the topic uh, than I'd even hoped for, Claire. I really appreciate you <laughs> taking the time. Just to um, just to finish off then, if we just allow ourselves a little bit of uh, future gazing, but not too far, let's say 2025, you know, just three years away. Um, what, what do you think, you know, is there a potential for EV charging not just vehicle to grid, but just just managing EV charging generally, or the amount of EV charging mm. to make a significant difference in that time scale, and and if so, um, you know what what are the major obstacles that you think we all need to overcome in order to achieve that? Yeah, Any definitely. Thoughts? I yeah, I I mean, I think I think we're already starting to see um, really exciting levels of engagement and uptake in this next level of integration of service around EVs. Um, so with our Intelligent Octopus tariff, um, we haven't done any advertising or marketing around it. We've, I think we've recently broken 1500 customers. So, and that for me, that's, signif that's a significant number of people who are willing to give up control of their car overnight, ultimately. I mean, you, you can get it back if you need to, there's, a, there's an emergency release button, but you know, give up control of how much charge and when in return for the benefit of a, this, um, this really, you know, excellent tariff. So to me, those those green shoots are there, and actually, it's it's the restrictions on supply of electric vehicles that worries me. About you know, that's a very limiting step. Um, there's lots of macro macroeconomic factors at play there. You know, there's a there's a chip shortage that's been going on for quite a while. Um, we know that. Um, Supply is going to be impacted by the situation at the moment with the war in Ukraine, um, because there are critical minerals um, that are mined and produced in, in Ukraine and, and in Russia, that, that we're going to see restrictions on supply continue. So that's that's what concerns me, rather than, I guess, will people accept these services and, and therefore can we make the most of these you know, these, these batteries um, when the cars are not being driven? I think that actually the customers will not just accept it, but demand it because it, their eyes are open to the benefits and the opportunities there around having those batteries just sort of ready to use to support the grid and, and, and to help them financially. I think it's going to be more about, can we get enough cars for the demand? And then and there's always this debate, or not always, there is a debate around infrastructure. Is there enough charging of the right type in the right place? And what again, what excites me is that there's so much innovation happening in that space that maybe isn't visible. So just a couple of words on that really that um as well as a lot of focus on where should we have um you know public charging locally uh, where should we have public charging where there are already parking facilities so i think it's you know mm. it's it's a, there's a lot of local authorities that are really starting to lean into this now and think about how do i electrify that parking space so that's really exciting um and um, again, we're looking forward to uh, having the conversation of, cool, now you've electrified it and you've encouraged someone to park there, maybe overnight because they haven't got a driveway, but it's a safe place to charge your car overnight and park it. Now, can we do flexibility with that? So now you've got a car park of 100 vehicles, which has become actually a car park of 100 batteries that you can mm. turn on and off at the same time. So that I'm really excited about that, you know, like community flexibility type project. So that's cool. And that's that's going to open up a lot. But also community charging opportunities, you know, renting someone's driveway and charger um which there's a huge opportunity there which has yet to be properly mm. explored so i think i i'm also not so concerned about infrastructure um because i think there's an awful lot there and and it's coming and i guess we hear the good news stories about the grid surf hubs and uh and you know and like i've just seen uh, recently uh like macquarie have bought a uh, road chef with a view of making them like you know charging hubs uh, on the bigger main sort of arterial road mm. so i think i think from from that perspective i'm really hopeful also around the the infrastructure for charging um because i think actually it's going a lot faster so i think to cast our minds forward to 2025 i think we will see um many more kind of destination charging locations local to more of us i think uh we will see the the rise and rise of the kind of community charging you know rent my space rent my charger get access to a charger 
five minutes from your house type models. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we will probably still have more demand than can be met uh, for the vehicles themselves. But I think it will be very much improving. So yeah, that's those are my predictions. Let's come back to me in 2025 and we'll see how I did. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. Uh, earlier on, when you talked about the challenges the world is yet again going through, um, yeah. you talked about when it writes itself. And uh, and I, <laughs> I think that's a nice, uh, nice thing to think about. Let's all hope it does that very soon. And, um, you know, it, it feels to me like, um, you know, in all of these technology innovations, uh, you have this kind of crossing the chasm thing where you go have to go from the early adopters who are very tolerant yeah. of um, uh, things not working in return for WYSI features to mainstream users who just want it to work each time, every time. And and if it does feel to me like we're going through that right now um, in right. EV, which is really exciting. And, and it sounds, you know, it feels like there's this really quite strong pull, increasing pull for EVs for, for, uh, you know, from consumers. We just have to have to satisfy it somehow. So, so uh, that's really positive. Claire, I'm so grateful to you for the time you've taken to share your uh, amazing insights with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.